Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the August 2024 CTS Us quiz. I have 10 excellent cases for you, so let's get started. In this patient with rectal pain, the most likely diagnosis is, well, when you look at the images, axial, you see a large mass that's not only in the presacral space, pushing against the distended bladder, but also apparently involving the patient's sacrum. When you look at the sagittal view, you can see this destruction of the sacrum and coccyx. Yes, you could think about something like rectal cancer invading bone. That's usually recurrent rectal cancer, but it can be primary. But this is too well defined. And typically when you have rectal involvement of the bone, it's irregular. Lymphoma typically is not going to extend like that. It's just not the appearance and involvement of lymphoma. Giant cell tumor of the sacrum can occur and have a soft tissue mass, but then the bone of the sacrum is expanded, your typical giant cell appearance. This is classic location for a chordoma. Chordomas can be large, there's bony destruction, there's infiltration, there can be extension to pushing on the rectum or even invading the rectum. This was an excellent example of a sacral chordoma. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, we see a large mass which is cystic in the right pericardiac zone. Now at first glance, the first thing I'm gonna say is a pericardial cyst, but then you see it really comes to the anterior metastinum. Not that it's too large, but the epicenter really isn't the perfect pericardial cyst. It's more likely, and in fact, this was a thymic cyst. Bronchogenic cysts, not a great location, typically subcarinal, duplication cysts are closer to the esophagus. So yes, I would have considered a pericardial cyst, and often, just from the axial images, I probably would have been correct. But when you look at the coronal view and you look at the extent, this was an excellent example of a thymic cyst. The least likely diagnosis in this case is least likely is always a challenge to me. I see a mass in the mesentery that's solid, maybe some calcifications, infiltrating the SMA and this desmoplastic reaction. To me, the differential here is typically carcinoid versus sclerosing mesenteritis. Carcinoid usually has more of a desmoplastic reaction. Both of them can have calcification in up to 70% of cases. This ended up being a carcinoid tumor, by the way. Lymphoma typically doesn't give that type of desmoplastic process, but lymphoma is one of the things that can infiltrate the mesentery. So I still would have to consider that, though less likely. This is not a neurogenic tumor. Neurogenic tumors are usually well-defined. They're low attenuation. They're more likely in the posterior mediastinum. They're more likely in the posterior compartment of the abdomen. They're just not in the root of the mesentery, typically, and they don't have this infiltrating process. So the least likely diagnosis is a neurogenic tumor. And again, this was a carcinoid. In this patient with GI bleed, the least likely diagnosis is. Now, I'm giving you a lot of questions with least likely diagnosis because it makes you think about things. If you look in the proximal jejunum, there's a one and a half centimeter mass that's vascular. The differential here is between gist and carcinoid, and that's a very common lesion to bleed. In fact, the way I distinguish the two, gists are typically more exophytic. Carcinoids may have a desmoplastic reaction, but may not when they're smaller. This, at the end of the day, ended up being a gist tumor. If the patient had renal cell carcinoma, renal cell can go to small bowel, can go to stomach, goes to adrenal, goes to pancreas, and they're always vascular. So that would be a possibility. A mass in the small bowel could always be lymphoma, but lymphoma is never going to be vascular. The fact that this lesion is vascular makes it the least likely diagnosis. To date, I've not seen a vascular small bowel lymphoma. I've seen them small and polypoid, like the shape here. They're often infiltrating. They're often multiple. You may or may not have associated adenopathy. The most likely diagnosis in this case is... Well, you see what looks like a mass in the IVC. Now, if you have 
tumor extending into the IVC, like in this case, and you see some neovascularity, the three things I think about are renal cell growing into renal vein up to IVC, often into atrium, primary adrenal carcinoma, which again extends into IVC and up into atrium, and hepatoma, again, extends into IVC and then could extend into the atrium. But I don't see a hepatoma, I don't see a renal cell, and I don't see an adrenal cell. Now, other things, you can have stromal sarcomas, which extend from the pelvis up the iliac veins and the IVC upward, but here we only see it beginning about the level of the renal vein up toward the base of the heart. And this was a primary IVC sarcoma, the typically leiomyosarcomas. They can extend the length of the IVC or in any portion. They can be infrarenal or suprarenal, as in this case, and this was a primary IVC sarcoma. The least likely diagnosis in this case, arterial and venous phase imaging shows me a large mass with some vascularity at the edge. The mass is solid, but it's low attenuation. It's solitary. There might be some textural changes in the liver. So hepatoma is a possibility. Though when I don't see vascularity, I tend to think about cholangiocarcinoma. And in fact, this was a primary cholangio. You can see metastatic disease from things like colon cancer or lung cancer, for example. They're often multiple, but they can be solitary and they can be large, less common, but they can be. What this is not is hydatid liver disease. Hydatid disease is cystic, but has daughter cysts and septations it doesn't have this appearance. And so the least likely diagnosis is going to be hydatid liver disease. The least likely diagnosis in this case is, you see an infiltrating tumor left lobe into right lobe of liver. There's lots of neovascularity present. This looks like an aggressive tumor. It could be a hepatoma. It could be an angiosarcoma, which are typically very vascular, often don't involve the spleen. We don't see the spleen much here. It could be hepatic adenoma. Hepatic adenomas usually, but not always, are better defined. And if this was a hepatic adenoma, it would be a hepatic adenoma that was transitioning into a hepatoma. The one thing this is not is a hemangioma. Hemangiomas can be large. They can replace almost the entire liver, but that peripheral puddling with filling in from peripheral to central is classic. And here we have infiltrating vessels. This is an aggressive tumor, which indeed was an angiosarcoma, but the least likely diagnosis would have been hemangioma. The most likely diagnosis in this case is I see a mass in the liver on axial and coronal. I'm only showing you one phase, which makes it more difficult. But what I see is a vascular lesion only as bright as the IVC, well-defined with a central scar. Now, hepatomas usually are irregular. Almost any lesion can have a central scar because of central necrosis. But the liver is not cirrhotic. Cholangios are typically low CT attenuation, not hypervascular. Hemangioma is a vascular, but they have peripheral enhancement and fill in from a peripheral to central pattern. They're not totally a vascular and this lower attenuation vascularity on the arterial phase imaging. On the other hand, FNH, mass, non serotic liver, very vascular, homogeneous central necrosis. This was an excellent example of a benign lesion, focal nodular hyperplasia. In this IV drug abuse case, the key finding is, well, if you look at the chest, there are pleural effusions, consolidation, and what does appear to be a PE in the left lower lung, that's important. But when you look at the abdomen, it's a younger patient, the vessels all look good, except when you look at the SMA, you see a large thrombus. So yes, the patient does have a PE. This is not the pattern of classic vasculitis, like large vessel disease, giant cell. It's not a pseudoaneurysm, which is seeing a thrombi in the SMA. And so what we're dealing with here is septic embolism to the SMA, not an uncommon finding, but often an overlooked finding in patients with a history of IV drug abuse. In this patient being treated for hypertension, the best diagnosis is 
Now the history here is everything. You see dilated small bowel, it's extensive. The bowel is edematous. You could think about bleed just because the bowel is edematous, but I don't see active bleeding. It's not the look of Crohn's disease where you see narrowing of bowel and submucosal enhancement. It's not really bowel obstruction, though the bowel is dilated. It looks edematous. There's ascites present. Then I told you hypertension. Patients with hypertension are often treated with ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors are one of the things that causes bowel thickening due to angioedema. Typically, the patient's been on ACE inhibitors for literally a day or two. They recently came back from their doctor and they present to the ER. Patients with ACE inhibitor-induced angioedema, you stop the medication, the patients will do fine. They may need supportive care for a day or so, but then they're going to be cured. So an excellent example of ACE inhibitor-induced angioedema. It's a diagnosis which does occur every day, but often is not considered. Well, that's the end of the 10 cases. I hope you enjoyed them. A number of the cases had the least likely diagnosis, so I was keeping you on your toes and making you think. And with that, have a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.